All right, guys, let's get going. So we are, as I said, refreshing dynamics because this is astrodynamics and I need to refresh things that you may know very well. If that's the case, be patient. If not, uh, take advantage of this. So we said last time, dynamics is the discipline that allows us to represent, uh, explain, and predict motion. Um, and it, it's, it doesn't matter if it's a particle mass uh, of, of mass M, if it's a rigid body, if it's a flexible object, which we're not going to see. That's what dynamics does for you. Now, uh, the first thing to keep in mind is if we're looking at something evolving, uh, we need to be aware of what kind of space we're moving in. So just for your knowledge, it's really not that big of a deal to remember this, but we're moving in Euclidean, Euclidean three-dimensional space. And this space, the volume we're living in, that we call this way, has several properties which we shall not refresh here, but one of them is measuring the ability to measure distances, uh, you know, with the fine vectors in E3. Everything we do is in E3. Uh, we need to know the space, the environment in which we are operating and observing things. Now, uh, dynamics, as you may recall, is made of two components. The first one, is kinematics and the second one is kinetics. I'm basically just going over, maybe we'll do an example as well, going over how you solve problems because that's what we're going to do. We just look at satellites instead of, I don't know, pipes and little masses moving around. Uh, we look at actual objects, but it's still dynamics. So um, kinematics is also, I'm just going to continue here what we call the geometry of motion, right? Geometry of motion. Which means it's the part that represents motion being completely blind about why things are evolving the way they are evolving. I don't need to know what is causing the motion, I just represent it. So here what you do is you care about positions, You care about velocities, you have to compute the velocities actually. You care about accelerations, I'm gonna stop it here, and also angular velocities and accelerations. Okay, there's nothing here telling us why things are moving the way they're moving. We just represent the state of a particle, the state of a rigid body, etc., etc. While here we have the explanation, here we have the laws of mechanics. Right? When we do kinetics, you start from kinematics, you compute all your vectors, those are all vectors, by the way, and once you're done with that part, you start looking at your problem and saying, okay, these are the forces that are involved, these are the torques that are involved, and so here, as I just said, you care about forces and torques. Just to be completely thorough, I just said those are all vectors. I hope we all remember what a vector is, right? It's a quantity that has in E3, of course, a quantity that has, let's say, with magnitude and direction. As I'm sure you recall, you've heard several times the statement that a vector couldn't care less about who the observer is. If this is my vector, I know it doesn't look like one, but, or this, or something else, something longer. The little arrow that we usually represent, you know, we draw on a piece of paper and we call it a vector. This object exists in this space here, regardless of you, you being here or not. They don't care about who the observer is. And that's what we use in dynamics to represent all those quantities there. Okay. Um, what else do I want to tell you? How do you actually translate now all these nice words that I've told you, because these are all in words, into quantifiable 
means things that engineers can handle. Worry is the first thing you have to think about, or you have to define actually, when you are observing motion and you want to represent it, you want to explain it, you want to predict it. At the end of the day, when you solve dynamics problems, what you do is you're looking for equations of motion, right? And so those equations of motion that you want to obtain are, are obtained through kinematics and kinetics, but um, I need some tools. What is the first thing you have to define when you're looking at an object moving around? Reference frame. Who is the observer? I'm going to go even more high level. Observers. There may be more than one in your problem, or you may want to choose more than one because it's convenient. And we call those reference frames. What is a reference frame? Let's go deeper and deeper here. We're engineers. We have to come up with some definitions. That is not a reference frame. That is a coordinate system. How many coordinate systems can you have in a reference frame? You can have infinite ones. This is a reference frame. This is a reference frame. I can be, if I freeze myself, I can be a reference frame. So a reference frame is a collection of at least three non-collinear points. Is the writing big enough? I hope so. Whose mutual distances uh, how do we say this? Don't change with time or are constant. Should be the same equivalent thing. Okay. So for example, this board can be my reference frame. I choose point number one, I choose point number two, and I choose point number three, and that's enough. So if I call the board reference frame B, and I claim that I am the observer B, that means that I attach myself to the board, and I don't move, of course. If you pick your reference frame, your point of view, your perspective, to, obs to observe the world, you're not going to move around in that reference frame. It doesn't make any sense. So you have to be attached to the reference frame. So re reference frames are really, for the most part, when you solve problems, are objects. Massless objects or actual rigid bodies with a mass, it doesn't matter to us as long as you have at least three points that are not aligned and don't change the relative distances, that's a perfectly fine reference frame. This planet is a reference frame. This room is a reference frame, if you want to. Everything that has at least three points. So that's the first thing you do. You define reference frame slash frames. You may have more than one. Then what do you do? I don't need these three points. Then you define coordinate systems because, again, I'm an engineer. I haven't given you anything that allows you to really express vector positions, velocities. None of these can be done by just saying I give you three points, right? So the next step is once you've chosen, you've chosen your reference frames, you go with coordinate systems. And again, in a frame, you can have infinite coordinate systems. But once you pick a coordinate system, you better attach that to one and only one reference frame. You don't move your ruler around. We are in 3D Euclidean space, so we need something three-dimensional that allows me to express vectors. Okay? So um, what do you do? You choose your reference frame. You pick a point. That's the first step. Pick an origin which is fixed in some reference frame that you've, you have defined. Again, we'll do a simple problem just to refresh all these things. And then you choose a basis, right? Which has to be basically three uh, linearly independent, I'm going to leave it at this for now, vectors. In other words, as long as you pick three vectors that don't uh, live in the same plane, that's a basis, right? That's a legit basis. But uh, we don't like to suffer, so we usually make our life a little easier. We don't pick just 
random uh, vectors, we pick what? We pick, I'm going to start here again. Right. We like right-handed, orthonormal bases because they're nice. So we usually do this. Right-handed. I never seen anyone using left-handed, but you can. Uh, basis. So in other words, let's say that I have these three, these, these three vectors, E1, E2, and E3, that they are fixed in some uh, reference frame, I don't know, A, call it A. They have to respect these conditions. EI dotted with EJ is zero. These are two vectors. This is a dot scalar product. Gives you a scalar if i and j are different. Bless you. That's the uh, being normal to each other. And then ei norm is always one for i equal to one, two, and three. Uh, I'm sorry. This is the normal part. This is the orthogonal part, of course. Uh, so we're taking care of that, and then right-handed, you do this, or, since I'm not get that good at doing that, you've probably seen it from other faculty in this department, if you want to make sure that your basis is right-handed, just put the names of your unit vectors clockwise in this little diagram, and remember that going clockwise gives you positive cross products. I do this. When I prepare problems for dynamics, for astrodynamics, anywhere where I have to do a cross product, I do this. Just put it on a piece of paper on the side so I don't make mistakes. Because I'm lazy. I don't want to do the right-hand rule. So E1 cross with E2 is E3. E2 cross with E3 is E1. It doesn't matter where you start. If you go clockwise, it's plus. If you go the other way, it's minus. E1 cross with E3 is minus E2, and so on and so forth. OK. I have almost everything to start attacking problems in dynamics, at least the kinematics part. I have the space I'm moving in, it's E3. I know that I have to define reference frames. I know that I have to define coordinate systems so that I can start defining vectors. What is next? This is a very quick refresher. So I uh, hope I'm not confusing too many of you, but I just want to touch on the main things there are the takeaways from dynamics. What is the next thing? What is the velocity vector? It's a time derivative of another vector. Right? Right? Or position. So we need to deal with this fact that we have to take time derivatives of vectors. A lot of times we have to do that. Um, now, if we're dealing with a scalar temperature, say that T of time is the temperature of an object, you know, your body temperature. You can take its rate of change just like that. Whatever that is, if that's a function that you can write, you can write it this way if you want. I don't have to specify if I am taking the time derivative while I'm walking this way or you're doing it while you're sitting there, it does not going to change. It's the same time derivative, right? In other words, Scalars don't care about the observer, but vectors do. Usual example, again, this vector moves around like this. We do see a non-zero time derivative of this vector, right? But if I go with it myself, so I change as an observer, I don't see anything changing, but you do. So rates of change of vectors do depend on the observer. In other words, if you're given a vector b, and you're taking the rate of change of that vector b, and you stop at this. This is a zero, uh, actually it's a minus 10 in any dynamics class. You have to tell me who is the observer, which we usually indicate as a letter up there. At least that's, that's what I do. Uh, and it could be reference frame A, observer A, or B, or C, whoever that is. You have to specify who is doing that, OK? So what is that very powerful tool that you use and abuse over the years of college in engineering that has to do with time derivatives of vectors? The yeah, the transport here. So we'll go here. 
We're going to refresh that very quickly. Say that I have two reference frames, two observers. You sitting there and myself walking back and forth. So we have A and B are two reference frames. And uh, let's say that I have a basis, E1, E2, E3, fixed in B. And a little B vector there that I can express in that basis. So I have the ability to write this. OK? I can do it. So since there are two observers here, I may take the rate of change of this vector. For some reason, this is maybe a position um, in any of those two. If I start from B, and I take the rate of change of little b with respect to the observer capital B here, well, this is rate of change of the scalar component B1, E1, plus the same for the other ones. And that's it because, why? Right, because this one better be fixed in B. Otherwise, it's not a basis. It's not part of a coordinate system for B. And I stop right there, and I'm done. But I may need the other one. DB in DT with respect to A now. How is this going to look like? I'm going to have this again because I use the product rule when I take time derivatives. So I'm still going to have this piece, of course. But now the uh, little e1, 2, and 3 do change because they're not attached to a. So I have these other terms, d, e1, in dt with respect to a, plus b2, d, e2, dt with respect to a, plus b3, d, e3 with respect to time done by A. And we do remember that those additional last three terms can be expressed in a more compact way. Well, first of all, this one, I know what it is, right? I have just done it. It's the rate of change of B seen by observer capital B. So I'm just going to write that. D B and T of A is equal to D B T in B. So those additional three terms, we're not demonstrating this, but it can be demonstrated. This, this expression is not a magic formula or is not a law. It's a derived result. So go back to your dynamics books and, and notes. This can be demonstrated. It's omega B with respect to A cross with B. This is your transport theorem, which is basically telling you that if you are the guy called B and you have an easy time expressing the vector in your basis, you can take that time derivative, no problem. But then your friend A comes along and he wants to know how B is changing from his point of view. Well, if you, you don't have to write B in this basis that is, that is going with A. If you know how b moves with respect to a, which is given by this piece of information here, the angular velocity of b with respect to a, then you have this expression that you can apply. So the use of the transport theorem is twofold here. The first one is you may have problems, as I just stated, where there is an observer that can express a vector in his basis, but another one that cannot do it that easily. But you do know how the frames move with respect to each other, so you can still find this time derivative which is extremely powerful. So this guy cannot express the vector, but he still knows how it changes. And the other one, which is more common that you've probably seen in many, many problems, is that even though you can express B in A, in a basis fixed in A, it may just be so painful to do the calculations with that uh, that you don't want to do it. Because they may lead to a lot of sines, cosines, and who knows what, and, and, and the expressions become extremely difficult to handle for complex problems that you're better off using the transport theorem. 
We'll do a very quick example if you want. Do we remember this? By the way, these are all vectors. This is a vector. Rate of change is a vector. Rate of change is a vector. This is a cross product of two vectors. Properties that we need to remember. What is this thing here? Now, for a simple single axis rotation, I can tell you what the angular velocity is very easily. Say that I have a basis E1, E2, and E3 is pointing at you like the little E3, and this is fixed in, in A. And then uh, this is the one that is fixed in B that we just uh, defined there. And there is just a pure rotation that I can represent with an angle theta. So basically the frame B, the object B, is rotating about the axis E3, uh, and, and that's, that's all it's happening. In this case, you can easily show to yourself that this is the angular velocity of B with respect to A, right? Or since the two E3 axes are the same, that's, that's what you have. This is true for a single axis rotation. Never ever think about doing that for three-dimensional rotations. It's not just the addition of alpha dot axis plus beta dot another axis plus gamma dot another axis. That, it's not that simple. When you have three-dimensional rotations, uh, it becomes a lot uglier than this, but we do have another very nice property, which is the chain rule. <coughs> Say that I have three frames now involved, just for example, A, B, and C. I can write the angular velocity of C with respect to A as the angular velocity of C with respect to B plus the angular velocity of B with respect to C. I always do it this way. You go from the right to the left with the superscripts. C to B, B, uh, what did I do? This is A, sorry. C to B, B to A, I'm basically jumping from C to A here. You have seen all the angles, I hope, before. We'll see them again uh, with a little bit of attention. Uh, but basically, the chain rule will allow you to take a three-dimensional complete rotation between two frames. You can break it down into single axis elementary rotations and add them together and find the final expression for the angular velocity where you will still see time, first time derivatives of three angles called the other angles except there's going to be a lot of sines and cosines, and it's not going to be very nice, but that's what it is. But it's a powerful tool uh, that we have at our disposal that you can go with intermediate reference frames. What else do we know about the angular velocity that it's interesting and we need to remember? We know that the angular velocity of B with respect to A is equal to minus the angular velocity of A with respect to B. Simple as that. And finally, we know that the rate of change of the angular velocity of a frame B with respect to A, uh, it's independent for once you can do it, you can forget that superscript there, it's independent of the observer. This is the only case where you can do that. And we call this the angular acceleration of B with respect to A. So here I don't have to write anything. Do you remember this? Do we remember how to prove this? Transport theorem. Pretty much every question one asks you about dynamics, the response is transport theorem, or maybe Newton's law. One of the two. Uh, so these are really the main things we need to remember to do kinematics, uh, pretty much. Do you want to see an example real quick? Just to refresh how we use this stuff? Let's do it. Uh, and the example that I give is always the same. I just, one or another is equivalent. I have the ground, little pipe running around, well actually rotating around, and a little mass inside of it. We haven't talked about kinetics by the way. Maybe we should do that first. Let's talk about kinetics first and then we'll do this problem, okay? So we can actually solve it entirely. So let's leave it there. So um, E3, reference frames, coordinate systems, transport theorem, properties of omega, Pretty much those, those cover, in my refresher, what we should remember about kinematics. Now what is kinetics? Kinetics are the laws of motion. And uh, even though the International Space Station travels about seven kilometers per second, so things in low Earth orbit go pretty fast, 
those speeds are still small compared to the speed of light. So for us, kinetics is equivalent to the laws of classical mechanics or Newtonian mechanics. What are those? These are valid if you don't go too fast compared to the speed of light. Um, well, three laws, inertia, a particle of mass m perseveres in a state of rest or constant velocity unless perturbed, you can state it that way, used and abused, f equal m a n, this guy is an inertial observer, remember the time derivatives depend on the observer and acceleration is a time, is a time derivative of velocity. So, what are these? Resultant of all forces acting on a particle of mass m, and this is the acceleration of that particle as seen by an inertial observer. What is an inertial observer or inertial reference frame? It doesn't exist, but we still define it. Yes, yeah, not accelerating. There are several definitions. One is it's an absolutely stationary reference frame or any frame that translates purely a constant velocity with respect to an absolutely stationary reference frame, which absolutely means nothing because even if you look at the far distant stars from here and they look fixed, they're not fixed. But uh, another way that I've seen over the years that it's equivalent is a reference frame is where this works. It's true. You, you perform an experiment in this room and you start applying forces to a mass and you measure its acceleration and you start collecting data and this is valid. Well, it means that for your experiment, this is a reference frame that is inertial. Good enough. It means that the forces that are involved, the time scales of your observations are okay with the assumption of being inertial, even though we are on a planet that is spinning about its axis and it's going around the sun. If I were to hang a Foucault pendulum, have you ever seen a Foucault pendulum in this room and wait half a day, oh, you would see that this room is not inertial because the plane of that oscillation will change over time. It's just that if you look at it for a minute, you don't see it. So it, it all depends. So for some things, a room can be an inertial reference frame. Um, for other things, it cannot be. It depends on your experiments. It really depends on what you're doing and what you're measuring. And then finally, there is always a price to whatever you do or you choose to do. If there is an action, there is a reaction. Okay, those are the laws that we use. So let's go back to that. And so basically what you do, if you recall, when you're solving a dynamics problem is you go through all that pain called kinematics to figure out this thing, the acceleration with respect to an inertial observer. Defining reference frames, coordinate systems, do your derivatives, transport theorem, whatever you have to do, you finally get this. And then, once you're done, you start modeling the forces. What forces are into play? Well, for us, in this class, it will be definitely and particularly gravitational forces, right? Gravitational. We will start with a simple model that goes back to Kepler, um, which basically assumes that this planet is a sphere or uniform mass distribution. So it's a formula that someone came up with by basically observing nature. They were looking at, astronomers were looking at motion of planets, and they came up with that expression. So all these models that we have for forces come from observation. So once we started flying actual satellites, we have come up with better models for the gravitational force around this planet. It's just observations. So anyways, that's what you do. Figure out the acceleration, and then uh, figure out the forces. So in this problem here, uh, I want to find the equations of motion for uh, this little particle here, let's call it P of mass m, and say that there is gravity here, and uh, I call, this is a planar problem, I call this angle theta, of course I have no room to do what I want to do, and so the goal for me, and this is the ground, and I'm assuming that this is inertial, I want to find the equations of motion. That is a good refresher. Before you even start 
writing anything, reference frames, coordinate systems, you need to know where you're going, what is your end point. And so the main question is, how many equations of motion? That's a pipe that it's rotating in this plane of the board about this hinged point here, O. It's rotating. And the mass in here can move. How many equations do you expect? One. Why one? Because there's only, it can only move in one direction. Unless it can translate up and down. You can translate, say, yeah, this, this particle here, it's inside an empty pipe, so it can go up and down inside the pipe. So it's two. So the first question you ask yourself is, how many degrees of freedom does my system have? Because that will tell you how many equations of motion you should obtain. There is no point in starting to attack a problem if you don't know what to expect. And so I gave you already a variable here, theta. Say that we call this distance P O R. So what I'm expecting here, I am expecting two differential equations of second order in R and theta, because I picked those variables. If I had picked x and y, it would be in x and y. I still need two because it's two degrees of freedom. Make sense? I know that I should get those. If I get only one, I am in trouble. Okay, now I can start. All right, so you start from kinet kinematics, I'm sorry, uh, which means you have to define your coordinate systems, reference frames, and all that stuff. Do it here. Well, one is already defined for you. It's the ground, it's right there, right? Reference frames, we have one is the ground, two, I'm going to use the pipe right here, call it A, so ground and A. Coordinate systems, rule of thumb, you recycle points that are in common between reference frames, O is fixed in both of them, so I want to say O as origin for both. And then, I'm going quick here. Uh, we're going to choose for G, for the ground, I'm going to choose, if you allow me to do it without writing sentences, E1 as the direction to the right when theta is equal to zero, fixed to G. E3 is pointing at us. And remember that little sketch? Just in case, I do it. I know it seems silly, but it's better than making a mistake. So I'm left with E2. E2 is E3 crossed with E1, so it's going this way. If I want it to be right-handed. And then uh, I'm going to say that for A, I pick little E1 as the direction that go f goes from O to P. So this will be little E1. This is, of course, the angle theta the E3 is overlap, they're the same thing, and then E3, E2, I'm sorry, will be this way, and 90 degrees. So we quickly have defined what we need. So there's two ways to, to solve this problem, and this is a very simple problem, so you'll probably say, hey, this guy's crazy solving it with the transport theorem, why is he doing that? Well, this is a simple planar problem. It's just to show you the advantage of having transport theorem. Um, so if I do it without the transport theorem, what do I do? My goal is applying this eventually. F equals MA with respect to G, because G is now my inertial observer. And I already know that the force here is nothing else than MG, right? I don't have anything else. Who here is a big fan of apparent forces, Coriolis and tripetal and all that stuff? They don't exist. They're not real forces. Uh, if we have time, we'll go through that, or maybe next time. But when you apply Newton's second law, in F, you only put real forces that come from gravitational fields, uh, electromagnetic fields, contact with surfaces, someone kicking the ball. There must be something going on that is real, not apparent forces. The apparent forces, what people call, when you express, they express this acceleration in a certain way, and you have a, a bunch of m times acceleration that has the dimension of a force, but it's not a force. So all I'm saying here is real forces go here, nothing else. 
And so that's figured out already, it's mg. Uh, I have to find this one. Now, if I, if I want, I can express directly my position vector since the origin is O. I have to express that vector that goes from O to P uh, and then take its time derivative twice with respect to G to find the acceleration. So if I want, I can do this. I can say that position is what? Um, in G, if I use that basis, R cosine of theta E1 plus uh, R sine of theta E2, right? Is that correct? I think so. Well then, the velocity of P with respect to G is the rate of change of this. It's R dot cos theta minus R theta dot sine of theta E1 plus, agree, disagree? R dot sine theta plus R theta dot cosine theta E2, and that's, that's your velocity with respect to the ground. I already see sines and cosines. I hate this thing already. I don't like it. But I keep going. Acceleration. Good luck with this one. Let's do it. R double dot cosine of theta. Uh, let's see. Minus R dot theta dot sine of theta, and that should take care of that. Then we have minus r dot theta dot sine of theta, minus r theta double dot sine of theta, minus, let's see, r theta dot squared cosine of theta e1. See how many things I have to do? for a simple problem like that. When I start doing all these things, I usually make a mistake, uh, but you can do it. Plus, do you want me to redo really the second piece? It's obvious that this is the way of doing it that I don't like, right? So I'm gonna stop right there. So plus the rest. And this is perfectly fine. You just do your second piece. Uh, you're going to equate these to what? Mg, you can write it as minus Mg uh, big E2, and you have your two equations, because you will have the acceleration projected on E1 that equals zero, because there's no force, no acceleration from gravity on E1. Agree? If anyone is confused, stop me. I know I'm going a little quick. Yes? How do I go? I'm sorry. This one? Yes, take the time derivative of this. Uh, everything in this expression, since I am taking the time derivative with respect to G, is changing except big E1 and big E2 because they're fixed in G. So I just take derivatives of scalars. Did I make a mistake? So it's R dot cosine of theta because R and theta can both change with time. They are my two variables. And then the second derivative is r theta dot sine of theta. The other should be right. r dot sine of theta plus r, yeah, makes sense. And so I just did this again. I take this entire function, and this is its time derivative times e1. Then this entire function, its time derivative times e2. And so you will have all this that it's equal to minus g. So your equations of motion will be this ugliness here equals to zero. And the second ugliness that you would have here equals to minus g. Those are your two equations of motion. With a bunch of sines and cosines, and, and this is a simple case. If I want to use the transport theorem, this is what I do. Instead of starting from writing r that way, I say that it's little r, little e1. Simple as that. And I say that the velocity with respect to the ground, which is still the rate of change of this vector with respect to g, can be broken down into the rate of change of the position with respect to a plus omega a g cross with r. Let's do this. What is the rate of change of r with respect to a? This is r. r dot e1, that's it, done, because little e1 doesn't change in a. 
What is omega a with respect to g? Well, that's a single axis rotation, that's why we picked that problem. Theta dot little e3, for example, cross with r little e1, which is giving me r, uh, I'm sorry, r dot e1 plus r theta dot e2. I like this a lot more than this already. There's no sines and cosines. When you use the transport theorem, you replace sines and cosines, algebraic calculations with more cross products. It's a trade-off. But quite frankly, uh, I think it's less risky to do this. And again, this is a simple problem. There are some cases where you really may be able still to start from something like this, express your vector in the basis that you want, and then you start taking the derivative and you say, forget it, this is way too much stuff. You start thinking about opening MATLAB and doing symbolic calculations in MATLAB and that's the end. So yeah, don't do it. If it gets that complicated, use, use this. Um, acceleration, respect to the ground. I have to take the rate of change of this with respect to uh, G. I'm going to use the transport theorem again. I'm going to say that this is rate of change of V with respect to the ground of this entire vector done by A plus omega A with respect to G cross V G. Okay? And so if you want, we do that. Uh, what is it? The first one is R double dot E1 plus R dot theta dot plus R theta double dot E2 plus we have omega, which is this expression again, which is crossing the entire velocity. R theta dot E2. Again, you see, you, you have more cross products here, but it's really not a big deal. R double dot E1 plus this, whatever it is, E2. Uh, let's do these cross products. I'm going to check there. What is E3 cross with E1 is E2. And then I have E3 cross with E2, which is minus E1. Right? This is R1. Uh, let's see, let's put everything together. R double dot minus R theta dot squared E1. And then we have, let's say, R dot theta dot plus twice R E. Twice is here, and this is r theta double dot. Correct? Did I miss anything? Looks okay, right? So this is your acceleration of that particle with respect to the ground. The fact that it's expressed in that little e basis, it doesn't matter. It's still a vector. What's the problem? Yeah, of course, you will have to equate these. If you want to find your equations of motion, then you will have to equate these to minus g e2, and then you'll have to figure out how to project big, big e2 into uh, the little e basis, but that's a simple step. Now, one thing that I want to observe here um, is, I told you before about apparent forces. Does this remind you of anything? These r dot, theta dot? Some velocity, some kind, some, some quantity that has to do with the velocity, r dot. Well, yeah, the theta dot, yes. But this, the r dot is, uh, is a linear, as the dimension of a linear velocity. That reminds me of this thing, 2 omega b with respect to a cross with the velocity of something with respect to b, right? Corioli acceleration. You know, you're more than welcome to remember all these expressions and give them names. They are nothing else than pieces that come out from the fact that you use the transport theorem. There's nothing else. And that you have used a non-inertial reference frame, which is B in this case. Uh, I'm sorry, A. I called it A. 
So the one thing that I wanted to start, and I'll probably finish next time, is so this, this hopefully refreshes you know, the procedure to solve a dynamics problem very quickly, but I'm touching on the main aspects of, the, of what we have to remember. There is one more question that always comes up, especially when, can I erase? When I explain the transport theorem, or I just refresh the transport theorem, so I'll rewrite it here, D of a generic vector B with respect to an observer, let's call it capital B, is D D T of the same vector with respect to A plus omega A B cross with B. This time I'm going from A to B, doesn't matter. Now, the question that always comes up for some reason is this. What if the two reference frames are rotating and translating with respect to each other? And my answer is, what? Nothing. This still works. If you go back to your dynamic classes and the derivation of the transport theorem, there is no assumption uh, that is made about A and B. They can do whatever they want. So, if you have, probably going to leave this to you as a little exercise and we'll finish it next time. But if you have, A uh, basis attached to a reference frame A, its origin is O. And then you have another one here attached to a reference frame B and its origin is O prime. And I'm looking at this little particle here P. And I hope I can go in a straight line. Yeah, that's, so this would be the position of P measured from O. Uh, let's call it this R of P. And this is the position of P measured from O prime. And then finally, I can also connect the two origins and call this the position of O prime. So how do I relate velocities and accelerations seen by these two guys, A and B? What would you do? You just apply the transport theorem all over the place. So these are two frames that can, they don't share the same origin. They can rotate with respect to each other. They can translate. I don't care. What do you do? You just start from this. The position of P is the position of O prime plus the position of P with respect to O prime. And you start taking derivatives. And we'll start it now. We'll finish the problem next time. But you will get those expressions where there is the centripetal acceleration, the Coriolis accelerations, those things that, at least in my days, we would have to memorize. Those acceleration expressions that relate how this observer sees the acceleration of point P and this observer sees the acceleration of point P. Those relationships that people memorize. You don't have to memorize them. You just derive them every time, every time you solve the problem. But we can from just applying the transport theorem. So let's start this real quick and then you continue. Okay, say that I want velocity and acceleration seen by A. Well, velocity of P with respect to A is the rate of change of these two vectors with respect to A. What is the rate of change of O prime of this vector here that goes from O to O prime with respect to A? It's the velocity of O prime seen by A. And then I have this guy. Since I'm going from O prime to P, most likely that vector will be expressed in a basis fixed to B. So I can apply the transport theorem to this one and say that this is equal to the rate of change of RP with respect to O prime in B plus omega B with respect to A cross with RP O prime, which I can also write as velocity of O prime in A plus, what is this? No. Nope. This is the velocity of prime. This is the velocity of P seen by B. Imagine that you are observer B. You are this guy right here. This is the position vector for you. And if you take the rate of change with respect to yourself of that position vector, you're getting the velocity that you are measuring. Right? 
Okay, that's what it is. Plus this additional term that really doesn't change, it's, it's what it is, this cross product here. Doesn't this look familiar? Doesn't this look like something that for some reason someone told you to remember? Not me. They told me to remember this thing, I never remember it. But I remember people saying, okay, the velocity, if you call this the fixed frame and this is the moving frame, the velocity of the point P seen by the fixed frame is the velocity of the origin of the moving frame with respect to the fixed one, plus the velocity of the particle seen by the moving observer, plus this cross product. Why do you need to memorize this stuff? There is no need to memorize any of these pieces or this these poem that I just told you, because it's transport theorem, that's nothing else. So we'll do the acceleration next time, try to do it yourself, you'll derive another expression that supposedly you, you can memorize or not. Have a good weekend.